The events of chapter 38 are twice declared to be in the last days. So that would preclude any historic interpretation of these passages. Uh, they are in the last days, and we will point that out as we get to those scriptures. Secondly, there are many who believe that the battle and the, uh, that is described here is the battle of Armageddon. I personally do not believe that it is the battle of Armageddon, and these are the reasons why I do not believe that. First of all, the participants. The battle of Armageddon, as I understand it, will be more or less a worldwide war. The chief participants will be the Antichrist and the Western powers versus the powers from the East that will come uh, to fight against the Antichrist and the Western powers. As we get into Daniel, we find that the Antichrist is leading the Western powers down into Africa, probably for the purpose of conquering that continent, when tidings out of the east trouble him and out of the north and uh, the river Euphrates is dried up to make way for the kings of the east and as the eastern nations band together and come to stop the power of the western expansion, they meet in the valley of Megiddo for that final conflict, which is actually halted by the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, we will get that as we move into Daniel and then later into Zechariah. So in this battle described, it is a limited participation. Uh, the, uh, the object of the battle is Israel itself. And uh, the aggressors will be limited uh, in that they are more or less those uh, Islam nations that have already threatened to try to destroy Israel. The place of the battle, of course, Armageddon tells you that it is the Valley of Megiddo. Here, the uh, corpse will be buried in the Valley of the Passengers, which is east of the Dead Sea. And so uh, the, the placement of the battle is different. I am not really going to try to interpret Ezekiel 38 and 39. I am going to only try to identify for you uh, some of the names of the nations that are involved, and we'll just read what the Scripture has to say. Uh, we will define a few Hebrew words for you so that uh, you can then just see what the Scripture says and make up your own mind concerning it. Uh, I think that when you try to interpret things, you begin to get into the spiritualizing of it, and uh, you can make it uh, really meaningless. And I think that it is very clear in what it declares, and so let's just see what Ezekiel has to say about this. Now remember, chapter 36 dealt with the restoring of the nation as far as agriculture. Uh, the mountains will be covered with trees. Uh, they'll be tilled and sown. Uh, they will produce an abundance of fruit and abundance of corn. 
Uh, the land that was so barren and desolate has become like a garden of Eden. That has happened. Chapter 36, for the most part, is fulfilled. Chapter 37 dealt with the rebirth of the nation, that God would gather them back into the land. They had been scattered all over the world, but God would gather them back in the land, make them one nation, and that has been fulfilled. As of uh, May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. Now, having developed the land, having brought them back into the land, we come into chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog is the chief prince of Magog. Gog is not a, uh, not a land or territory in this sense, but is the chief prince of Magog. Now, Magog has been identified by the historians as uh, the Scythians, and they were the ones who occupied the area uh, in the Crimea, uh, north of the Crimea, uh, they uh, were at, of course, this time when Ezekiel was writing, a very uh, insignificant uh, race of semi-wild people. And um, they dwelt mainly in that area north of the Caucasus and between the Black Sea and the Caspian. So uh, that is the area that would today be the southern provinces of the former Soviet Union. And um, these provinces have come into the news lately uh, because there seems to be an alliance that is being made between Iran and these southern provinces of the former Soviet Union, which are for the most part uh, Muslims. And so um, Meshach and Tubal have been thought to be uh, the ancient uh, uh, Tiberi and uh, Muscovy, which of course is uh, today more or less known as Moscow and Toblenz. That is, uh, or Toblosk. Uh, that is not for certain. You can leave that as a question mark, a possibility for sure, but a question mark. Um, God's word. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn you back and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you forth with all your army, horses, horsemen, all of them clothed, with all sorts of armor, a great company, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So the description of the army that is coming, uh, of course, uh, Ezekiel is uh, describing uh, in words that were familiar to those days and the type of uh, weapons that would be used. But now the nations, and I think that it is significant, the nations that are named, but I think also it's significant are the nations that are not named, nations that we would, in our own minds, be certain that would be allied uh, with this uh, group because of their 
uh, past history, recent history, in their attempt to exterminate Israel. But the nations that are involved in this war, along with Magog, are Persia, which of course today is Iran. And we know the militancy of the Iranians. We see the demonstrations. Um, the current government has no real love for the West, uh, for the United States, and certainly not for Israel. In fact, uh, they are constantly uh, rallying their troops uh, with the um, goal of uh, taking Jerusalem back for uh, Islam. And uh, they are constantly making threats uh, and announcing their intentions of uh, invading Israel. Ethiopia. Uh, was a part of the communist bloc. It is very strong uh, Muslim center today, as is Libya. All of them with their shields and their helmets. Now, Ethiopia and Libya, you don't need any identification for that. Gomer and all of his bands. Now, uh, Gomer of uh, was in the area just um, sort of north of Turkey. And uh, you can find it in your Bible maps. Along with Togarma, which is the area of Turkey. And uh, these again are Muslim uh, nations. Thus, the nations that are allied together seem to be predominantly Muslim nations, which would indicate the possibility of sort of a announced jihad against Israel. The interesting thing to me is that Egypt is not named. However, Ethiopia, south of Egypt, and uh, Libya, west of Egypt, is named. Egypt is not named with these nations. Now, whether the omission is just an omission or whether it is by God's design is something we will discover uh, after the fact. We, I mean, anything that we would suggest would be speculation. It is interesting to me that Syria is not mentioned, though Syria has been a perennial foe of Israel. Jordan is not mentioned. Now, it is interesting that Egypt has made a peace treaty with Israel, and because of their peace treaty with Israel, uh, Israel, of course, you remember, gave them back a large portion of the Sinai uh, to create this peace treaty. And... Uh, it could be, uh, you remember, the rest of the Islam nations have been angry at Egypt for making a treaty with Israel because it recognizes it as a nation. Uh, Syria is in the, at the very moment negotiating a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, you read about it in the paper, and uh, there is even talk of the Israelis returning a part of the Golan Heights uh, to Syria in order to facilitate a peace treaty. Uh, it, it, it's just significant to me that neither of these nations, uh, or uh, the three if you want to include Jordan, plus Babylon or Iraq is not listed. And uh, yet, if you and I were setting up the scenario, surely we would have included these nations that have expressed their desire 
to destroy Israel. Some of them have, of course, even attempted to do so uh, since the birth of this nation. And so uh, fascinating that Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan are not mentioned as aggressors with this consortium of nations that will be joining together for the invasion. So in verse 7, Be thou prepared, prepare for yourself, you and all of your company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. For after many days, the time of the battle, thou shalt be visited in the last days. The latter days is again translated last days. You shall come into the land that has been brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Chapter 36 was, of course, prophesied to the mountains of Israel. Now they're going to come against these mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. That is, since Israel was uh, dispersed by the Romans in 70 A.D., the mountains of Israel became wasted, wilderness area. And, of course, the prophecy was they would be replanted and fruitful again. And so you will come against these mountains of Israel, which have been always waste for those almost 2,000 years, but has been brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, some, of the, some people say, well, Israel isn't dwelling safely, has never dwelled safely since it has become a nation. They've already had three wars uh, with the surrounding nations. And so uh, how can you say they are dwelling safely? If you will look up the Hebrew word safely in your lexicon, you will find that the word literally means confidently. Now, they may not be safe, but they're confident. You talk to them, and you'll find they are very confident, and they are dwelling confidently, though perhaps not safely, uh, as, as we would think of safely, but who in the world dwells safely, pray tell, in these days, anywhere in the world. Uh, yesterday, right up here on Warner, uh, and Broadway in Santa Ana, a young man stabbed to death, stabbed some 18 times, and there was a big rumble right at the corner of Bristol and Warner about the same time. So you can't really say that you're dwelling safely, uh, but confidently, and they will be dwelling confidently. Thou shalt ascend and come like a cloud, that is, uh, or like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. A large number of personnel involved in this invasion. You and all of your bands and many people with you. The chief aggressor will be Magog, but uh, with all of these other nations combining with them. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into your mind and you're going to think an evil thought. You will say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell confidently, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, the only walled city that you'll find in Israel today is the old city of Jerusalem uh, with the walls that were built by Saladin that are still intact. And, and you have this small section of Jerusalem, a very small section that is walled. But the major part of Jerusalem is outside of that old walled uh, area. So uh, it, it's just sort of decorative, really. Uh, it, 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 it's great tourist attraction because it's interesting to see the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, 
it, 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 if you'd say, well, Jerusalem is a walled city uh, to a Jew, they would laugh at you because uh, it's such a small portion and it's just that portion within, but all around it for miles and miles stretches the city of Jerusalem. And when you come to the outskirts, you don't find walls. So they're dwelling confidently without walls. And you've come to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, the, the land that has been uh, recovered and redeveloped, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, as in chapter 37, God would gather them out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, that dwell in the midst of the land. Now, um, what is one of the major problems in Russia today? Lack of food. We have been sending over food uh, to the people. You've seen the pictures of them standing in lines uh, to get food. In fact, they say that there in Moscow, people will be standing in line and, and you go up and say, well, what's for sale? What are you waiting for? Don't know. We'll find out when we get there, you know. Because sometimes they'll run out of one item and so by the time they get up there, they've, they've got something else, but they'll buy whatever is there because of the scarcity. Here is Israel, as small as it is, it's, it's extremely productive. Uh, it is the fourth largest exporter of uh, produce of all of the nations of the world. And uh, so they're coming to take a spoil. It speaks of the cattle and of the goods. Now, here's an interesting thing. For Sheba and Dedan are going to object to the invasion. Who is Sheba and Dedan? Saudi Arabia. Now, can you imagine any kind of a scenario where Saudi Arabia would be speaking up for Israel? Would be objecting to an invasion? The only scenario I can imagine is that Saudi Arabia feels threatened by the invasion and that they are perhaps a target also of the invaders for the tremendous wealth of the oil reserves that they have. The Valley of Passengers is in the area of Saudi Arabia, east and south of the Dead Sea, so that it is quite possible that this is an attempt to take over the oil reserves. And the interesting thing is that Saddam Hussein had a goal of taking Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. He was stopped by the combined forces that joined in the Desert Storm operation. Had he taken Saudi Arabia, it would be a different story today because we are so dependent upon the oil that we are getting out of the Middle East that we could not survive as a uh, industrial nation unless we have the oil that we are getting from that area. That is why we stepped in. That is why we intervene. Because if they can control the oil, they can control the world at this time, the world's economy. And they are very well aware of that. They are aware of the power of oil. Uh, they became aware of that in 1973 with the oil embargo and when they uh, doubled and quadrupled the prices of oil and they realized what a bargaining chip they have and they've been using it ever since. 
upon the Western nations. And uh, they have a sort of over a barrel, so to speak, uh, because we are dependent upon their oil. And uh, they are masterfully using that as a pawn in this giant game of chess, international game of chess. The interesting thing is that Iran has been training their troops for a land invasion from the sea. And the only place that Iran could possibly be thinking of invading would be Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And so it is possible that Iran will seek to do what Hussein failed to do, and that is to gain and control the wealth of Saudi Arabia's oil. Now, um, that is the possible reason why they are objecting to this whole invasion. It could be that Saudi Arabia is being invaded by Iran, Persia, as the troops from Russia, the north, uh, are coming on against Israel so that the whole um, thing could be just an attempt to gain world control and world power. The merchants of Tarshish, there is a difference of opinion among Bible commentators of who Tarshish is. Some say Spain, some say England. Uh, if it be England, then the young lions thereof uh, could possibly include the United States as we are sort of a established as an English colony and then broke off. Uh, so the young lions thereof shall say unto you, Are you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered your company to take a prey, to carry away the silver and gold, and to take away the cattle and the goods and a great spoil? Is this your object? Uh, that sounds like a... Uh, appeal to the UN to uh, sanction uh, these nations for invading Israel. It doesn't say that we are going to be moving forces. Uh, it just uh, is a verbal kind of an objection, uh, filing a uh, paper with the Security Council asking them to condemn uh, these nations for this aggression. Now, that sets up the scene of the battle. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell confidently, shall you not know it? And you shall come from your place out of the north parts, just get your map out and look at Jerusalem and look directly north of Jerusalem and find out what you see. Moscow is just about due north of Jerusalem. You come out of your north parts, you, many people with you, all of them riding upon the horses, a great company, a mighty army, and you shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the last days and I will bring you against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. The Lord is saying, this is it. The, the nations will know that I am God when I am sanctified before their eyes. Uh, this phrase, sanctified before their eyes, we're going to get that two or three more times, and you'll see the importance of it. Just make a note in your mind now. We'll be back to that. Thus saith the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, 
which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring you against them? It shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Now, in its history, God fought for Israel. Many of the Bibles describe, uh, many of the biblical battles describe God's divine intervention, destroying their enemies with hailstones, fire and brimstone, coming down from heaven, destroying their enemies with plagues, uh, driving out the inhabitants from before them, and how God was with them in battle, putting to confusion their enemies. And God is once again going to manifest himself in this battle in a supernatural intervention. He will describe to us the supernatural events by which the invading army will be destroyed. God said, when you do this, my fury is going to come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, tremendous earthquake, so that the fish of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all of the creeping things that creep upon the earth all of the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground, a severe earthquake shaking that whole area, all of those that are in it. There is something rather awesome about a major earthquake. Now, we've had some minor earthquakes. Uh, but there is something rather awesome about major earthquakes that you feel so totally helpless. You just wonder, when's this thing going to quit shaking? And my thought, whenever I feel the beginning of an earthquake, my thought is always, how hard is the main jolt going to be? And, and you feel it swaying, 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 but you're waiting for that snap. And you wonder just how hard it's going to snap when it hits. This is going to be a major earthquake. Now, you go to the area of Israel, especially down into the uh, Jordan Valley, and you see these sheer cliffs along the Jordan Valley. And uh, there are many landslides down in that area, and I can imagine what it will be uh, in a tremendous earthquake. Actually, the whole valley was formed, they believe, by an earthquake uh, years ago. Uh, the Syro, the Syro African uh, rift, uh, they feel, was caused by a giant earthquake. And uh, so can you imagine a, an earthquake of, say, an 8.2 8 magnitude, what it would do in the destruction over there? Uh, the walls, <laughs> most of them are, are uh, not, they do not use the reinforced uh, steel. They're, uh, in so many of the buildings are just uh, rocks upon rocks, and without reinforced steel, uh, it's going to be devastating. And uh, so the Lord describes uh, the whole place being shaken, the walls falling to the ground. And I will call for a sword, the Lord said, against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. When this earthquake and these cataclysmic things begin to happen, there will be such confusion that there will become, uh, there will come actually a inner strife among these nations 
and they'll begin to fight each other and they will begin to destroy each other. Um, you know that, uh, of course, the area of Russia is com completely divided now. There's all kinds of uh, ethnic strife that is taking place in Russia, and this will just trigger ethnic strife throughout uh, that whole area like uh, you've not seen yet. And I will plead God's intervention against him with pestilence, with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain of great hailstones, fire and brimstone. So God's intervention, earthquake, hailstones, fire and brimstone. And thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. Now, God said, I'll be sanctified, and this is how. In the destruction of this overwhelming force that is coming against Israel, and it seems that Israel doesn't have a chance against these overwhelming odds. Armed with the latest type of weapons, Israel won't seem to have a chance, and yet God is going to miraculously intervene supernatural events. Now, interestingly enough, and I guess for our benefit, Newsweek magazine this week had a very fascinating article on uh, the peril of the world being uh, destroyed by an asteroid or a comet uh, and uh, the article was very interesting reading when, you, when they describe what happens when, uh, say, an uh, asteroid uh, the size of, um, of a building, say the size of this building, of an asteroid, would, would hit the Earth. Um, it would leave a, a, a giant uh, hole. It would vaporize the dirt which would go up into the atmosphere, the rocks and all, and then they begin to fall back like fiery rain uh, because as they're falling back through the atmosphere, the speed and so forth, they would uh, turn into fire and read it. You'd think that the scientists are reading out of Ezekiel or Revelation uh, when they describe uh, what would happen uh, if uh, we had a collision with an asteroid. And uh, we have, according to the uh, article, about 10 possibilities a year of an asteroid hitting us. Uh, they seem to be developed out there near Jupiter someplace, and then they uh, get kicked out of orbit, and they come in an orbit, and you never know when it's going to happen. And uh, a lot of them... I have, well, we had one just a year or so ago, and it came within 10 million miles, and we didn't even know it until after it was passed. Uh, but it was a close miss. And, uh, but uh, <laughs> they say that one uh, that was, say, a mile square would actually destroy mankind. Uh, we, we, we wouldn't survive. Uh, so <laughs> who knows what God will use? Maybe he'll toss an asteroid. Uh, over in that direction, you know. And uh, surely the article does describe e the exact kind of a scenario that you read here in Ezekiel and in uh, Revelation. But, you know, however God does it is, is something that's in his domain and we can only guess. Now, he continues this same prophecy... And he said, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and leave but a sixth part of thee, and will cause you to come up from the north parts, and I will bring you upon the mountains of Israel. God said, I will turn you back, 
and leave only a sixth part, that is five out of six of the invading troops will be destroyed. Pretty heavy casualties. I will smite your bow out of your left hand and I will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. Um, you might take a look at the Hebrew word uh, and uh, the arrows are just flying missiles. Um, so um, <laughs> what are they? Who knows? Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all of thy bands, and the people that are with you, and I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You will fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Their destruction is certain. Their destruction is sure. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. Yet future, Israel has not yet really turned to God as a nation. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. The Lord said, Behold, it is come. It is done, saith the Lord. That's it. Uh, it is done. It's a, it's a done deal. It's, it's going to be. The Lord puts his seal to it. This is the day whereof I have spoken. God's spoken of this day for Israel for a long time. God is going to uh, again work directly with the nation of Israel. Now as we get into Daniel, the next book we move into, when we get into the ninth chapter, we will find that there have been 77s that have been determined by God upon the nation of Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for sin, to establish the uh, covenant, to finish the prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. And from the time the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, there would be 69 sevens, or 483 years. There were 77s determined, 69 were fulfilled to the coming of the Messiah. But the prophecy in Daniel goes on to say the Messiah would be cut off and not receive for himself. That is, would not receive the kingdom. 483 years after the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Jesus came, made his triumphant entry. He was crucified within the week without receiving the kingdom. Then there was going to be a prince of the people that would come and destroy the city and set up an abomination and all. But the 70th seven is yet to be fulfilled. That is, God has an unfulfilled seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel in which God is going to work and at the end of that seven-year covenant, your prophecies will be sealed, or that is completed. They will then bring in the Messiah, the reign of Jesus Christ, the, the second coming of our Lord to reign in power and glory. So this event in Ezekiel 38 is tied with this covenant that God made with Israel, and this defeat of their enemies will trigger the beginning of the last seven years. As we will move on and we will discover Ezekiel, Ezekiel speaking of that. So it is come, it is done. This is the day whereof I have spoken. The day when God would restore his spirit upon Israel and work with them again. Uh, Peter makes reference to how all of the prophets spoke of the final restitution 
uh, of all things, and that is the restitution of God's work among the people of Israel and their being restored as God's people. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the hand staves, the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years. They will go out and take the spoils of war, uh, the implements that have been brought in for this war, probably the fuel, uh, and will actually have a seven-year, interesting number of years, uh, a seven-year supply of fuel uh, that they won't have to really worry. You know, the interesting thing is that in the previous uh, wars, how Israel has gained uh, from the implements and weapons of war. Uh, when uh, they had that intrusion into southern Lebanon, uh, to create this buffer zone. They discovered these caves loaded with all kinds of Russian equipment, tanks, mortars, all kinds of weapons, rifles. In fact, they were three months removing all of the weapons out of these caves in these huge semi-trucks, some 26 of them working day and night for three months to transfer these weapons. They put them on display there in Israel for a time. All of the weapons that Russia had moved into uh, southern Lebanon and had stored in these caves in preparation for an invasion. And so, again, they're going to profit from the spoils of war. It shall come to pass in that day, verse 11, that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves. God's going to bury him there. In Israel, the valley of passengers on the east of the sea. And uh, it'll stink. It'll stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog and all of his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all of the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a, a renown, a, a, the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. And after the end of seven months shall they search. In other words, uh, they will be searching for seven months for the, uh, the bodies that have been destroyed by the hand of God uh, throughout the area. Now, the interesting thing to me is found in verse 15. First, verse 14 tells us there will be professional barriers, but verse 15 says, And the passengers that pass through the land, when any sees a man's bone, he will set up a sign by it until the barriers, barriers have buried it in the valley of Ham and Gog. They'll take it across the other side and bury it on the east side uh, of the sea, in this valley known as the Valley of Passengers or Ham and Gog. But notice the people don't touch the bones. They set up a flag near it so that the professionals come and handle the bones. Uh, turn to Zechariah chapter 14. And in conjunction with this, we have an interesting verse 12. Zechariah also speaks about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And about how the enemies round about are going to seek to fight against her. 
And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all of the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will be consumed in their sockets, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Um, it sounds like death from severe radiation. Uh, I will let you to draw your own conclusions as to uh, what that implies. But it would imply that people are afraid to touch the bones, perhaps because of radiation. They don't touch the bones, they just set up flags, and the professionals come to bury them. It could indicate that definitely uh, nuclear devices will be involved in this war and in the destruction of Israel's enemies. And also the name of the city shall be Hamona, uh, thus shall they cleanse the land. And thou, son of man, speak, saith the Lord God, speak, uh, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come and gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you might eat the flesh and drink the blood, and you shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of the rams and lambs and of the goats and bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. Now, this is why many people, many um, uh, commentators believe that this perhaps is also the battle of Armageddon, because in chapter 17, of the book of Revelation, you find at the battle of Armageddon, the birds are all invited to come and feast at the feast that God prepares. Uh, but um, in both battles, there are gonna be plenty of uh, bodies to feed upon for the vultures and all, and so the invitation to come. Incidentally, a few years ago, there was some track about uh, vultures multiplying in Israel, uh, but uh, no real fact to it. You know, like, you hear these crazy rumors. And, and they seem to spread, you know, like these scientists that were drilling this hole down in Siberia or in upper Russia or something, and put a microphone down and heard, you know, all of these uh, groans. And, and, it just, and they, have, they have these stories that circulate, you know. Uh, uh, Madeleine O'Hare is now petitioning the FCC to cut off all Christian radio. That's not true. That, uh, it's just, but these petitions, they, they, they're like chain letters. They just keep coming around. And uh, people go out and get all these signatures. And the FCC has pleaded. They've sent us letters and said, please tell the people, don't send any more petitions. We've got so many bundles and we don't know what to do with them and there's nothing to it. We have no intention of, of taking Christian radio off and all, but uh, these petitions, they get circulated again and there's just a, a lot of these, you know, the couple that picked up a hitchhiker and he sat in the back seat and warned him Jesus was coming soon and then he disappeared, you know. And uh, these stories, they just, have a way of, of recirculating, and I heard that one first back in the 40s. Uh, so, uh, and I've heard, uh, you know, versions of it since. Someone took a picture of a cloud, and there was Jesus standing in the formation in the cloud, you know, and all of these things. So, um, <laughs> don't be dismayed <laughs> at the stories that you may hear. Um, there are no increase of vultures in Israel. Uh, <laughs> ye shall eat the fat till ye be full. Talking to the birds and vultures and all. You'll drink the blood till you're drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. And thus you will be filled at my table with horses, chariots, the mighty men, with the men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen. And the heathen shall see my judgment, 
when I have executed and my hand that I have laid upon them. The nations will see my power. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. This marks the day, the day the Lord said of which he has spoken, the day in which they again turn to God. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity because of their iniquity, because they had trespassed against me. Therefore, I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies, and so they fell by the sword. Because of their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them, and I have hid my face from them. But he will no longer hide his face he is going to again reveal himself to them. Therefore, uh, Paul said, is, blindness has happened to part, in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. But then all Israel shall be slave. God is going to deal with them again. And so uh, right now they're in that national blindness. They're blind to the Jesus Christ, to the truths of God. But there will come that day when God will work again. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt confidently in their land and none made them afraid. Uh, when I have brought them again from the people, gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Uh, go back to verse 23 of chapter 38. When he destroys this invading army, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and will be known in the eyes of many nations. So that day when he destroys these invading armies, then, he said, shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the nations, but I have gathered them into their own land and have left none of them any more there. And then this is the key verse. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Joel's prophecy partially fulfilled in the church. It shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. Upon my servants and handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit in that day, saith the Lord. And there shall be blood and fire and vapor of smoke, moon turned into blood, the sun into darkness, before the great notable day of the Lord comes. So you're entering here then, uh, into that period when God pours out his spirit, the great tribulation when God judges the world because of the sin, and then the glorious return of Jesus Christ and uh, our being gathered together uh, unto him. So uh, we're, we're in between chapter 37 and chapter 38 as far as looking at the world today. Chapter 36 was fulfilled. Uh, it, it began at the turn of the century, the redevelopment of the land. Uh, chapter 37 was fulfilled in May of 1948. And uh, I pray that 38 and 39 will be fulfilled before we hit the end of the century. Uh, who knows, though, it, it, when God is going to work. But this is the next major event uh, to come along. Uh, and so watch for a continued uh, romance between the southern provinces of Russia and Iran uh, as they are joining together. They need the Iranian money that uh, Iran, of course, has as a result of her oil reserves. Iran desires 
their military equipment, which they are anxious to sell because they need the cash. And so there is a, uh, a marriage that is taking place now and uh, the development of military uh, weapons uh, by Iran. They have hired over 5,000 of the Russian nuclear scientists uh, and they are seeking to develop their own nuclear capability besides having purchased uh, nuclear weapons from uh, Kyrgyzstan. And so uh, the whole thing is shaping up now before our very eyes. Keep alerted when you see articles in Newsweek, Time, and so forth on the Middle East, upon Iran, and so forth. Pour over them because you'll find that what Ezekiel told us about is really shaping up now. And uh, the thing is, it is my belief that when God puts his spirit again upon Israel, and the spirit of God is working among the people of Israel, that the church will have departed. I believe that right now the Spirit of God has been poured out upon the church and upon the Gentile believers. And I believe God's Spirit is working basically among the Gentile nations. As Paul said, blindness has happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And that we as a wild branch have been grafted in to partake of the, of the fatness of, of the promises of God and all. But don't boast against the true branch because God is able to graft the true branch back in, which he will, and God will again work with the nation of Israel. But when he does, the church will have been removed. We know that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until that which hinders is taken out of the way. That which hinders shall hinder until it is removed, and then shall the Antichrist be revealed. I believe that that which hinders the revelation of the Antichrist is the power of the Holy Spirit within the church, the witness of the church through the Spirit. That's the thing that's holding back the Antichrist today. When the church is removed, then God will no longer leave Israel in blindness, will reveal himself to Israel. His spirit will be poured out upon Israel and uh, you will enter into that final seven-year scenario uh, that is described through many places in the Bible as God seals the 144,000 of the Jews uh, to uh, preserve them. They will be his primary witnesses here on the earth during that seven-year period of time the church out of here. So uh, it's sort of like uh, when you see the Santa Clauses and reindeer going up, you know that Thanksgiving is getting close. Uh, <laughs> because you know that Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. Uh, when you see these signs of the return of Jesus Christ, uh, you realize that the rapture of the church is getting very close because it precedes the return of the Lord in glory. For when Jesus comes again, then Paul said, when Christ who is our life shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. Uh, coming with him to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of of his saints. And so, uh, as Jesus said in Luke, when you see these things begin to come to pass, now, do you think they've begun to come to pass? I mean, can you see any hints that uh, Iran is sort of getting chummy with Russia, at least uh, with the southern uh, provinces there? Uh, can you see Libya sort of antagonistic towards Israel? Uh, you know, is it, has it begun to come to pass? I think so myself. Uh, Jesus said, look up and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing nigh. And really, 
as I look at the world today, as I look at our United States today, none too soon. None too soon. I look at the moral conditions of our nation. We have a president who vows to open up the military to the homosexuals, to the gay community. We have a president who says he's going to enact special legislation for them. A president who said he is going to uh, seek to get a law uh, that will uh, allow abortion so that it won't be a matter of the court, but it will become the law of the land. Uh, I'd say we're in big trouble. I, I would, I would, no, let me rephrase that. I'd say the United States is in big trouble. I'd say we're out of here. <laughs> so look up, lift up your head. It's getting close. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. For your word, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. A map whereby we can follow. A map that leads us, Lord, in the right path, your path. May we walk, Lord, in your ways. May we be obedient unto your word. And Lord, help us to so live in these days. When the enemy is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, Lord, may we be steadfast and unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. And so, Father, we thank you again for the word of God, a guide for our lives. May we follow its precepts. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? <laughs> what do you want to sing, Val? Huh? Got the joy, joy. Got the joy, joy. This guy wants to sing for you. <laughs> this good-looking guy happens to be my grandson. <laughs> okay, you gonna sing it? All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, sing with you. All right. <laughs> really, uh, he's a ventriloquist, and I'll move my lips, but he'll be singing. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Is that it? All right. God bless you.